Good morning and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, speakers, delegates, everyone from wherever you're joining us from around the world. A warm welcome to all of you. I'm Sharon Jeet Lale, and it's a great pleasure for me to be moderating this next session where we'll be discussing a woman-focused recovery for a more inclusive post-COVID future. Now, thank you to the ADB for organizing this very important discussion. I think we can all safely agree that this last year has been a traumatic one for all of us, dealing with a pandemic and the dire implications of its fallout. As some of you are joining us virtually from countries that are in various states of lockdown. And I thank you for making time for this discussion in spite of the many stresses that you must all be facing. Now, I think we can also uh, agree that this pandemic has not been in the least gender neutral and has been particularly challenging for women. Now, a number of studies, uh, which you'll go on to hear about, have shown that COVID-19 has wiped away a disproportionately higher share of women, women's jobs, widening gender gaps in labor market access and increasing women's vulnerability to poverty. But we know as vaccinations continue around the world, we see economies bouncing back. And we look towards a recovery that addresses inequalities work to ensure a more inclusive view and new normal. Now this morning, we'll be hearing from policymakers, representatives from the private sector and development partners to discuss ambitious approaches to build back better through women's entrepreneurship financial inclusion and decent jobs for women. And I hope that uh, this hour long discussion will be very thought provoking to all of you joining us. And I encourage you to ask questions in the chat function. I will be getting to them at the end of the discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists for the next hour. First off, Dr. Sanya Nishta, who's the special assistant to the prime minister of Pakistan on poverty alleviation and social safety, and is the chairperson of BISP. Next, we have Joseph Sweglick Jr., a deputy chief economist of the Economics and Research Department of the Asian Development Bank. Wendy Telecki, who's the head of the WeFi Secretariat of the World Bank Group. Denise Harut, executive director of sustainable finance from Standard Chartered Bank and Joni Simpson, the Senior Specialist Gender Equality and Non-Discrimination uh, Department at the International Labour Organization. Welcome to all of you. I'm so excited about our discussion over the next hour. Now, let's start with, of course, the, the, the horrific uh, nature of this pandemic and just the assessment of how damaging this last year has been in terms of how COVID-19 has impacted women. We know both the ADB and the ILO have put out some very important studies looking into this. So let's bring in uh, Joni and Joseph, first of all, into this discussion. Uh, let's start with you, Joseph. Could you give us an overview of just how uh, damaging this last year has been to women and in, the, in their participation in the labor force? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sharanjeet. And I'd like to welcome everyone to ADB's 54th annual meeting. Um, so just to give, a, I guess, a bit of background um, on, uh, to set the stage, if you will, for the, the discussion, uh, I, we know that the mortality rates from COVID-19 are higher for men, but some of the negative uh, socioeconomic impacts are more pronounced for women, including a higher unpaid care burden. So unlike the impact of, of a recent financial crisis, the pandemic affected uh, women's jobs and livelihoods to a much greater extent than men, exacerbating prevailing gender inequalities and exposing gender fault lines. In my opening comments, I'd like to touch on three uh, particular areas. The first is uh, health and safety. Uh, lockdown policies due to COVID-19 reduced overall access to health care, with more women reporting being unable to seek medical care or experiencing longer waiting times to visit doctors. For pregnant women, the reduction in prenatal care could put mothers at higher birth-related morbidity risk. Quarantine measures uh, also affected access to food, which means pregnant women may not have gotten appropriate nutrition during critical points in their child's development. Both the lower access to health care and nutrition could have longer-term implications for child development. 
Uh, women also take on more of the burden of increased family care at home, and women are overrepresented in the care industry. This raises the risk of COVID-19 infection above what would have been the case if there was a more neutral, a gender neutral distribution of these tasks. Job losses and worsened mental health stresses may increase the risk of gender-based violence at home. Uh, this problem is exacerbated by the reduced availability of support services for victims of domestic violence. Further, incidents of violence may go unreported as victims are shut in with their abusers and cut off from social and family networks. Second, I'd like to discuss the education aspects. In the latest Asian Development Outlook, ADB estimated that learning losses from school closures will substantially reduce future productivity and earnings. Estimates show that students affected by school closures stand to lose an average of $180 or 2.4% decline in expected annual earnings. The present value of these future earnings losses adds up to an estimated $1.25 trillion for developing Asia, which is equivalent to 5.4% of the region's GDP in 2020. Uh, while this is not disaggregated by gender, I just wanted to point to the, the magnitude of the losses that our, uh, economies are likely to experience and then take that into the context of uh, the differences between uh, how girls and, and, and boys may be affected for their future earnings. So prior to the pandemic, we had seen significant progress eliminating gender disparities in education. But as schools reopen, particular attention will need to be given to girls to ensure that they return to classes. This may be hindered by the income losses families have faced during the pandemic. And so cash transfers may be needed to ensure that investment in girls continues. Otherwise, those losses for girls will be on a much larger magnitude than the, the losses for boys. Um, and, and third is the, the uh, impacts that we're seeing in job markets. Now, I, I won't go into too much detail so as not to overlap with the presentation of Joni Simpson. Uh, but let me highlight a job market consequence of, of the two earlier points that are raised. Although both m men and women in Asia surveyed by UN Women reported increased hours spent in unpaid care and domestic work at home, women were starting at a much higher level. Uh, the burden of child, uh, children's education and care of sick family members will complicate women's return to the workforce, possibly reducing their already low labor force participation rate. Uh, so finally, let me make just a, a quick point about how ADB has responded. Um, ADB recognized early on that women would be hard hit by the pandemic and introduced mitigation measures to protect them from increased poverty. Gender is mainstreamed in all of ADB's COVID-19 response packages called CPROs, which included gender targets across the main budget support areas to ensure women do not fall further behind. For example, in entrepreneurship support programs, ADB introduced baseline targets for women entrepreneurs to ensure equitable access to these programs. In addition, CPROs also included support to civil society organizations tackling gender-based violence in recognition of the other pandemic that it was emerging as a result. Um, so I'm looking forward to a, an interesting discussion and uh, let me turn the floor back over to Sharon Jean. Thank you for that, Joseph. Uh, I mean, you cited some really staggering statistics there, of which uh, I think Joni has uh, much more because the ILO put out a very comprehensive study of just how awful it's been uh, for women's participation in the labor force. Uh, Joni. Yes, well, indeed, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Um, Currently, we're looking at uh, quite, a, quite a bad story. The crisis has really struck a blow to gender equality in the region. Uh, women in the region were on average more affected by loss of working hours, uh, of course, uh, loss of income and employment losses than men, uh, largely owing to the fact that they're overrepresented in mostly uh, most of the heavily affected sectors like tourism, uh, manufacturing and trade, uh, and where supply chains were severely disrupted. Um, women were also uh, much more likely, uh, as was mentioned, to exit the labor force. And um, 
this is particularly worrying for women because once uh, his story shows that once they leave uh, the labor force, it is harder for them to get back, uh, possibly due to their unpaid care uh, burdens that were mentioned earlier. And globally, women's employment declined by 5% compared to 3.9% for men. And 90% uh, of women uh, losing their employment uh, exited the labor force. So again, this is um, this is quite worrisome if there aren't dedicated measures uh, put in place for the recovery phase and pathways to get them back to the workplace. Um, the unpaid care burdens uh, affect women across all sectors, uh, jobs and tasks, and due to lo lockdown, uh, homeschooling um, and sick family members, this has exacerbated further those uh, proportions of unpaid care which were already higher in this region. Uh, the global average was three times as much as men in this region, the global average is four times, so we see that going up. And while at the same time we've seen the importance of women's work and contributions in the frontline occupations, um, in nursing and care, uh, highlighting the, the importance of highly feminized but historically undervalued jobs and sectors. So currently women are on the front lines, uh, they're making up uh, and uh, the bulk of essential workers, including 70% of healthcare workers, uh, and already a care crisis was on the horizon in Asia Pacific uh, with aging populations, putting more pressure on women's time in particular. And the region has a, a big gap, a lack in publicly provided high quality childcare and elder care, which is needed for achieving gender equality, not only to enable women to access, advance and uh, stay in the world of work, but investing in these care infrastructures can have positive job growth potential for the recovery and beyond. And the crisis has further exposed major inequalities in the region, uh, disproportionately affecting lower skilled workers and informal workers living in poverty or on the margins of poverty. And again, this is where women find themselves concentrated. Uh, lower skilled workers account for 49% of job losses for women. And uh, the, the pandemic, uh, that, that's uh, relative to the no pandemic scenario. Evidence from countries where there is labor force position, uh, labor force survey data available also suggests that informal uh, workers accounted for much of the job losses across multiple sectors owing to their limited protection by uh, employment policies. And it's expected that there will be higher rates of informality and self-employment during the recovery, another area of concern. And we could see um, um, crowding out of women in their traditional jobs and sectors uh, during the recovery due to the absence of jobs. And I'd just like to um, highlight one more issue of the crisis, uh, which uh, indeed it was already mentioned, uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, but there is another aspect and the world of work has also been seeing increased violence and harassment, including gender-based violence with the work from home modality, um, online working increasing. So um, I'd, I'd mention here that the uh, Violence and Harassment Convention uh, was launched by workers, employers and governments across the world uh, just before the crisis hit. And it's certainly a relevant and a very important uh, framework for the recovery process. Um, I'll stop now and hand back to Sharon Jit. Thank you for that, Joni. I mean, what, what a dire picture that paints, and it, it is truly horrifying the kind of impact 2020 has had. But putting 2020 behind us, looking to 2021, uh, I can bring in uh, Dr. Sanya Nishta now uh, from Pakistan, uh, who is joining us with a, a very uh, particular government view, uh, a country view of what's being done and why governments should uh, you know, enable uh, women-focused COVID-19 recovery. Uh, so, Dr. Nishta, first of all, explain to us about what's going on in Pakistan at the moment. You have AHSAS, which is described as a, a pioneering poverty alleviation and welfare program. It encompasses uh, some 130 policies helping to protect uh, the most vulnerable women in, in Pakistan and uh, the poor. Uh, you have this, of course, alongside other programs like the Benazir Income Support Program. So explain to us uh, what Pakistan is doing. 
So, well, uh, good day to everyone. Uh, and I want to thank the Asian Development Bank for convening this very important uh, webinar. Uh, and since many of us are in the throes of the third wave of the pandemic, I want to wish you all um, safety, good health, wherever you are. In terms of your question and in terms of the overall flavor of this webinar, uh, which is centered on the need for women to be uh, at the heart of the recovery. Uh, I think the case for that is very clear. The rationale for that is very clear. The preamble has outlined that very eloquently. In terms of your question and SRS, um, as you yourself mentioned, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a poverty alleviation and social protection framework. It has myriad actions focusing on 14 target groups, um, it focuses on pro-poor governance, on human capital development, on social protection, on jo jobs and livelihoods. Uh, 14 target groups, seven time-bound outcome-based goals. And one of the very initial decisions we took was a policy called the 50% plus. Through 50% plus, the government of Pakistan uh, committed itself to allocating uh, and accruing 50% plus of all the benefits under SRS um, uh, for the welfare of women. Uh, SRS, by the way, means uh, compassion in our local language. So j just to give you a quick snapshot of what we mean by 50% plus, some of our programs, for instance, the unconditional cash transfer program, which currently uh, impacts 7 million families is 100% for women. Our asset transfer program is 60% for women. Uh, we took a fundamental decision uh, 24 months ago when our government came that all the benefits under the conditional cash transfer programs that we will have, whether it is the primary education conditional cash transfer or the recently uh, uh, introduced secondary education conditional cash transfer, uh, in, in all of them, the stipend will be higher for girls compared with boys. And this has really ushered in what I consider as a transformation on, in the field. Because in our far-flung areas where mothers do not even count their girls, if you ask them how many children you have, they will just say, uh, they will just count the boys. And in these parts of the countries, uh, suddenly families have started to value girls. Uh, with the government's clear indication that the, the, the cash transfer is going to be higher for girls. Then we introduced an undergraduate scholarship program, a need and a merit-based scholarship program, and a cash for work program, where the benefits have to very squarely be 50% and no less for, for women. Uh, in addition to that, there are a number of different policy approaches uh, centered on age for marriage, minimum wage, uh, equal wage, policy centered on home-based workers, informal workers, uh, rural workers, uh, rural women workers um, with, a, you know, with regard to recognizing their work. Um, so this was just to give you a snapshot of what SAS is about and its 50% policy is about. Uh, and I haven't gone through the entire comprehensive list because it also includes digital and financial inclusion with an explicit time-bound outcome-based goals and our initiatives to ensure access uh, of women to mobile phones and financial literacy and so on and so forth. But the, the reason why I gave you this overall flavor of what we are in the midst of implementing is because I want to share with you some lessons learned. Now, one of the clear lessons learned is uh, that the importance of data coupled with accountability for action and clear mechanisms for monitoring. Because when I initially uh, got this policy approved by our cabinet, the 50% plus policy, and was on the road to implementation in the first stock takes, the immediate reaction was, well, there aren't enough women coming forward for the interest-free loans, the, our cash for work instrument. The immediate reaction was that we do not have enough uh, women applying for undergraduate scholarships. Uh, and it was at that time that we, we continued to press 
no, you have to make a proactive uh, effort to bring women forward. You have to make a proactive effort to ensure that these targets are met. So the importance of data coupled with accountability uh, it has been very salient in our experience. Secondly, and reflecting a little bit on how SARS transitioned uh, to, to, to the COVID response mode, um, as some of you may be aware, Pakistan rolled out the biggest social protection program uh, in its history by reaching out to 15 million families, which are roughly uh, over 45% of the country's population with cash transfer, with SARS emergency cash transfer. And I genuinely believe that we averted a major humanitarian catastrophe during that cash du du during that phase when we were reaching out to people with uh, with, with uh, assistance uh, at the height of COVID. Uh, we we executed this totally through uh, through digital means. So uh, we we sought requests through SMS. We used data analytics to prepare the lists of eligible, and then we used commercial banks to uh, to deliver payments after biometric verification. And the impact of this was truly transformational in the field, as it meant uh, in terms of what it meant for people. But I think that it also assured. Uh, uh, it, it was also a watershed moment for our government in terms of fashioning a digital transformation. It made the government more agile, data-driven, experimental, ambitious, and it helped with the fast-track adoption of cost-effective digital ways of working and new ways of coordinating across multiple stakeholders, including the private sector, and deploying the whole of society approach. But, 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 but what I quickly want to emphasize that it also helped us to reimagine the role of women in the workforce uh, of tomorrow. So I think these two things, uh, these two policy lessons, these big ticket policy lessons from our experience in implementing SAS more broadly uh, with respect to the importance of data, regular monitoring, monitoring with regular cadence and accountability for delivery, number one, and secondly, in the COVID context, the way we were able to usher in a transformation in the way the government works uh, and, and, and how we think this will help us to reimagine the role of women in the workforce are the two big things that I would uh, say in response to your question. Uh, over and back to you, uh, Sharanjit. Thank you so much, Sanya. It's really quite extraordinary to learn what uh, Pakistan is doing. And as you say, uh, it's, it appears to be much more than just gender targets for your COVID support programs like ASAS. And um, so gratifying to hear about public and private sector working, which uh, we'll be hoping to talk about a little bit later as well and segues very nicely into the next question. Uh, and this is a whole of society response, as you say, it's so crucial. Thank you for those comments. And in fact, speaking of the private sector, we, we can uh, move on to that now because uh, we know that the COVID-19 recovery and, and response uh, would be nowhere without the private sector. So we want to hear about uh, the role of women's businesses in recovery uh, and uh, about the trends there, how the private sector helped mitigate risks and open more opportunities for women's businesses. And this is where I want to bring in uh, Wendy and Denise. Great to see you both. Uh, let's start with you, Wendy. Uh, of course, you run the WeFi Secretariat. And uh, since its launch in 2017, WeFi has allocated some $300 billion in total to some 39 different countries. It reaches over 130,000 women-run SMEs. Uh, 50 billion, in fact, was just the latest allocation, I believe, to uh, address uh, the issues of uh, COVID-19 and how they've impacted women's businesses. So could you give us examples uh, of, uh, of some of these WeFi-supported businesses and how they've benefited? Thank you very much, Sharanjit. It's really an honor to be here with you and with my fellow panelists to discuss such an important topic um, on behalf of WeFi. Um, and I'll just say a few words about WeFi and just maybe correct a little bit of the numbers, Sharanjit. But um, for those of you who maybe don't know, WeFi is a global partnership um, and we aim to unlock finance markets and skills for women-led small and medium businesses around the world in developing countries. Uh, we're supported by 14 donor governments and work through six multilateral development banks, including the Asian Development Bank, um, and we're housed in the World Bank. 
Um, as, as you mentioned, we are funding many countries. Uh, over 60 developing countries will be getting uh, programs supported by WeFi, including 12 in Asia. And we've allocated uh, close to $300 million uh, over the past three years. Um, and nearly 30% of that support to go, goes to Asia. Um, that money will leverage $3 billion in support for women entrepreneurs. So it will have a big impact on the countries where we operate. Um, the ADB's program uh, supports women entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and the Pacific. And other implementing partners are working in Asia, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Mongolia, Myanmar, and the Philippines, as well as many programs that we have outside of Asia. Um, so to give you some context about uh, women entrepreneurs, around the world, more than 252 million women are engaged in entrepreneurship. Um, and one third of all formal small and medium sized enterprises are owned and led by women. Entrepreneurship has been an important path out of poverty for so many women. And for others, it's a path to greater opportunity and empowerment. Um, women entrepreneurs introduce innovations and new solutions for their communities and industries, and they can help lift others out of poverty and transform economies. In Asia, uh, we have countries that have some of the highest and lowest rates of female entrepreneurship. Um, but in nearly all, female entrepreneurship lacks, lags beyond, behind male entrepreneurs, uh, both in terms of the prevalence of entrepreneurship and their ability to grow. Um, Women-owned firms average about half the size of male-led firms and face more significant financing constraints uh, with an estimated $1.7 trillion financing gap. So as we've heard from our previous speakers, women in general have been disproportionately affected by the COVID crisis, but small businesses have also experienced extreme duress. So when you put those two together and you look at the population of women-led SMEs, the results are really troubling. COVID has just made a bad situation worse. Uh, Women-led firms have seen around the world sharper drops in revenue than male-owned businesses. A big reason for that is that businesses tend to be less formal and concentrated in service industries that are more heavily affected by the crisis. Uh, many of the gains we had made to close the financing gap are faltering as financial institutions revert to their traditional customer bases. And that's both on the debt side and on the equity side. Uh, Women-led businesses have less access to technology, which has become a key factor in SME resilience during the crisis. So they have a longer way to catch up to migrate over to digital technologies. And now what we see is women are making heart-wrenching decisions to put their businesses on hold as they trade off their business responsibilities with their increased care responsibilities as was discussed earlier um, by the other panelists. Um, and at the same time, it's very heartening to hear all the work that Pakistan is doing. And there are countries that have really led the way, but in many countries, women are not getting access to COVID relief or sustained access to financial institutions through this crisis. According to one uh, bit of research, there have only been 20 national measures that are tracked by UNDP uh, that address the economic, financial, and fiscal elements of the crisis that specifically address women uh, in emerging markets. Um, so that's only about 5% of the measures that they're tracking. Um, and while MDBs are doing what they can to address the gender gaps, there's still so much more to do. We also don't have enough data to track what's happening uh, with the crisis. So um, we're, we're going blind in some cases um, in terms of what still needs to be done. So WeFi programs do look to help the MDBs uh, counter the adverse effects of COVID and ensure that old patterns of exclusion are not repeating themselves or getting worse. Um, like all WeFi programs, ADB's projects address financing gaps, market access and gender biases in policies and in their work with public and private sector partners. And with COVID, they have been adjusting to provide WSMEs with the support they need uh, to adapt to the new context. For example, in Vietnam, ADB is working with banks to find ways to restructure outstanding loans for women entrepreneurs impacted by the pandemic. And in Sri Lanka, WeFi has been supporting ADB to work with the government in partnership with local commercial banks to improve gender inclusive financial services. Other WeFi programs with our other implementing partners have addressed technology gaps in Central Asia, entrepreneurial ecosystem in Pakistan and value chains in Bangladesh. 
And just to make one final note about resilience and opportunity, even though the news is really dire, uh, we have seen in our programming so many examples of women who have used the crisis to pivot, transform, and take on new challenges. There's evidence that women entrepreneurs have been quicker to seek out new mentors, new technologies, and new opportunities. We, we really believe that as we emerge, women will be build back better and that their potential will be even greater than before. And it's more essential than ever that we support them to do this as they'll be pivotal to help address some of the long-term challenges we face, such as climate, community development, and inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. It's so great to hear what WeFi has been doing. And thank you for correcting those numbers. I, I believe I got them out of your annual report, but it, it's so gratifying to know that there is that kind of um, commitment towards helping women and particularly women run businesses and SMEs, as you say. Now, let's move over to Denise now. Um, uh, Denise, we know that Standard Chartered is doing some really creative things. Uh, for instance, uh, I believe you're developing a, a platform uh, to unlock capital for female entrepreneurs and, and uh, women-led SMEs. It's going to be the first algorithm-based investment platform uh, to prove the economic benefits of gender diversity in business. I mean, this sounds incredibly groundbreaking. <laughs> Tell us more. Uh, with pleasure, let me get to that in a minute. Um, at Standard Chartered Bank, our purpose is to drive commerce and prosperity through our unique diversity. We are an organization that is largely based in the uh, developing countries where our talent also you know, emerges from, from, from these markets. And our diversity and inclusion uh, sort of strategy has three key components. As a large employer in the developing markets, we want to attract, engage, develop, and most importantly, retain diverse talent. Uh, two, we want to deliver banking products and services that meet the, the needs of our diverse client base, uh, more inclusive uh, gender-based um, financing. And three, to support a diverse and responsible supply chain and continue to invest in our communities. Now, we've all heard uh, from, from the esteemed panelists uh, that the key role the women play in, in, in the economy as we recover from COVID and participation uh, varies across the markets. However, you know, we also noted the situation as Standard Chartered Bank, that this uh, has deteriorated further during the, during the part, uh, pandemic, particularly in supply chains in, in Asia. Uh, the pandemic no doubt has thrown us uh, back even further by reinforcing traditional gender roles in care and uh, disproportionately affecting women economically. Now, both Joe and Johnny and Randy have, have shared statistics on these points. Uh, we believe uh, the pandemic is likely to push you know, 47 million more women into poverty, reversing decades, uh, decades of progress uh, to eliminate extreme poverty. Now, on the positive side, the whole shift to remote working and the realization that it can actually improve productivity levels has raised the accept acceptance of flexible working. The future of work is no longer a distant proposition. During the pandemic, Standard Chartered Bank went from relatively low levels of remote working to 85% of our workforce now working from home. And in recent surveys, many of us uh, said that flexibility is empowering. We appreciate the ability to better manage you know, home and work demands, don't feel productivity was impacted at all, and we will consider longer term options for the, for the way we work. Reimagining these new ways of working virtually and more flexibly creates an opportunity to support our uh, DNI agenda. However, it has also brought some significant challenges. We became, I believe, the first bank to launch a standard for tackling domestic violence and abuse, offering help to colleagues uh, who need it. Now, what about, what about women in emerging markets? What about moving, uh, women in, in supply chains? And can sustainable finance help overcome the effects of COVID-19? We do recognize the banking community, community has an important role to play in stepping up and helping these communities build back better. One example is our Women's Livelihood Bond Series, an initiative to mobilize private capital to invest in a portfolio of high impact enterprises that empower women through sustainable livelihoods. It was the first multi-country listed gender bond uh, in Asia Pacific, benefiting underserved women across Asia. The bond was sold to institutional investors in the best in the best in developing markets, which proves that with well-structured blended finance initiatives, 
it is possible to unlock private capital uh, for the SDGs. We also have a very long-standing partnership, excuse me, with ADB in supporting microfinance institutions in the in the region. To date, we have provided funds to women-focused enterprises or microfinance institutions in Cambodia, India, Indonesia, and the Philippines, enabling hundreds of thousands of women to move out of uh, poverty. Now, we want to elevate that work and move beyond just microfinance and embed gender into um, uh, lending products uh, for SMEs uh, and supply chains, lifting participation. Now, it's on, on, on that point, it's important to also note that another big trend that COVID accelerated is digital. For many years, we've been talking to our clients about interacting with them via digital channels, but now it's the clients that are pulling us to interact with them digitally, and this will definitely spill over to, to supply chains as well. The whole way it hit the consumers to use mobile technology apps, etc., that mindset has now definitely gone into the corporate world. And the speed of adoption will be faster than, than the retail side. COVID just accelerated that at a pace none of us really expected. Now, combining this with the trend of sustainable investing and growing demand for ESG data, we now have the opportunity to act with scale. By embedding digital technologies and ESG into ways of our working, we can bring the transparency needed in portfolios and supply chains. When there's data, sustainable finance grows. From our Women's Livelihood Bond series experience, we know the capital is there and ready to be deployed. We know that there are hundreds of you know, large cap companies who have committed to SDGs and diversity in supply chains, but we're all failing to honor our commitments. We can now change that uh, by the right policies and the technology-enabled solutions. At Standard Chartered Bank, uh, together with our tech partners, we've developed a proof of concept that can build the world's largest credible pipeline of female-owned and female-led businesses. And we want to, uh, together with partners, turn this into a commercial product, unlocking business opportunities and access to finance for, for SMEs, particularly in the region. Uh, I'll stop there um, and hand it back to you, uh, Shirandi. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And in fact, uh, we've already had uh, questions uh, coming through, some very interested uh, uh, people. Uh, when you mentioned gender bonds, uh, I guess this is for both you and Wendy, um, a question coming through about how, uh, could you tell us more about gender bonds? Uh, how are they issued to mobilize funds for targeted programs on women? Are there pros and cons? So whomever wants to jump in here, Dennis or Wendy, are gender bonds a good idea? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the Women's Livelihood Bond Series is a brainchild of uh, IAX uh, Impact Partners based out of Singapore. Uh, together with their implementation partners, uh, they bring together a, a credible pipeline of uh, enterprises that support women or women-owned uh, enterprises. What we helped them achieve is, uh, together with our uh, development partners, we structured a portfolio of these loans together that benefits from uh, risk participation, uh, as well as uh, first loss capital, which is a very high impact catalytic way of supporting uh, blended finance, and uh, turned that whole portfolio into a publicly listed in instrument. The way that I like explaining it is that we effectively took the back streets of Pakistan mm -hmm. to Wall Street directly. And when you look at the underlying portfolio, those um, enterprises are very micro. So they would be very difficult to, for instance, be banked by Standard Chartered Bank, you know. Um, but by bringing it directly into, into the Wall Street, uh, by, by a blended finance, finance vehicle, we were able to get, you know, that large sums of uh, private sector money sitting in the developed markets uh, searching for yields to, to be unlocked for, um, for the right purpose. And I do believe uh, participation of the capital markets is very important in achieving the SDGs. Uh, it's the only way, obviously, we want to, if we want to really succeed on this ambitious agenda. And labeling the transactions with the right impact metrics uh, for the right purpose with credible partners is the, is the way to do it. That's great. And Wendy, I believe you wanted to jump in yes. too. 
Yeah, I can jump in also because bonds and capital markets mobilization is incredibly important to get the scale that we're looking for. And one of the big things for WeFi is making sure we're crowding in as much private capital to support women as possible. And bonds are one of the really important innovations that uh, we've been excited to support um, with our multilateral development banks. They've been working with local banks uh, to get the those banks to issue bonds for their SME portfolios. So they're raising funds that are allowing them to expand uh, significantly their lending to women in the local markets. Um, and we're using WeFi support to provide incentives for that lending to increase um, the incentives for the financial institutions to do more with women um, and go beyond the level of financing they would normally do in their normal course of business uh, to support women. So that's been a really important tool. Um, we've also seen the development of the standards around uh, gender bonds recently, and, and our members, our partners have played an important role in that. And we see this as an important part of the future of financing for women entrepreneurs. Yeah, a really innovative way to, to raise capital to, to help women mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, as you say. Thank you both. Now, at this point, I'm going to try to open the discussion to, to all of you. We've all heard some incredible insights uh, from all of you, what's being done, uh, you know, from the, the, the NGO side, the MDB side, the governmental side, the mm -hmm. private sector side. So let's go back now to uh, Sanya in Pakistan, because, you know, Obviously, you, you are overseeing a lot of these programs. You've uh, developed a lot of these programs to try to help women. So give us a sense of what you're seeing in terms of, of bottlenecks uh, you know, that are emerging for putting women's needs and interests at the center of the recovery policies and programs that you've been leading. Uh, what, what are some other challenges there? So in terms of the challenges and the bottlenecks, I think one of the biggest difficulties that women face, uh, uh, you know, is to strike a balance between professional and personal life. It's, uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, and I don't think this is an issue specific to Pakistan. This is a worldwide issue. Uh, this is not an issue specific to low-income countries. Um, this, this cuts across the core of the issues that women face across the world. Uh, it's basically this huge barrier when it comes to striking a balance between pers professional and personal life. And the solution to that is in societal mindsets. We don't have a technical solution to that. Secondly, uh, I have consistently observed uh, that men have a men's club and women's don't. I, I, I don't know how to put it in simpler words than that. Um, see the dynamic around the table uh, where there are predominantly men and perhaps less than 10% women, less than 5% women. And you will sense that the men in those decision-making roles have, have, a, have an unspoken bond. Uh, the women simply don't. And oftentimes they're working against each other. So the importance of building that relationship between women, uh, the importance of um, developing, you know, something that's analogous to the men's club, uh, I, I, and I don't know how to do that. Uh, is there a role for mentorship? Is there a role for role models? Uh, what are the levers in the work environment? Um, can we develop frameworks for peer-to-peer -peer learning? Uh, could there be twinning opportunities? Uh, could there be special mentorship for, for, for those women who are, who are at that last rung before they break that glass ceiling? Uh, because over and over again, I see that very strong bond between men, that men's club, that unwritten, unspoken women, men's club, but wherever there is a woman out there trying to bring change, she, she's often alone. Uh, she's often against many barriers, um, and, and we need to system, systemically find a way of addressing that. Uh, the third thing, I think, in terms of um, overcoming challenges and bottlenecks is to systematically um, try to push the needle uh, through policy levers um, to make a case for diversity in the workforce. 
uh, I think the key thing is to appreciate the value of diversity uh, because the world cannot afford to disregard what women, which are 50% of its population, uh, what women can bring to the table in terms of talent, skills, productive potential and leadership uh, acumen. Uh, and I think the key is that you're not making a case for the end of men as a famous title of an article in the Atlantic magazine once called for. Um, I think that's important. what's important is to bring to bear the importance of gender parity in the workplace uh, and leadership, and to emphasize that our world and our workplaces are seriously uh, out, out of balance. And I think the key is to bring to bear the importance of men and women together making better workplaces and, and, and leaders together. So, so, I would, uh, so I would categorize the bottlenecks in these three broad categories. Thank you, Sonia, and, and very eloquently said as well. Um, and in fact, there's some questions that have come in for you, but I'll, I'll hope to get to them later. Uh, I believe, Joni, uh, you can address some of these issues that uh, Sonia has just talked about, you know, women's leadership, women's representation. Tell us what's going on in terms of what the ILO is doing. Yes, well, well indeed, um, we, we see a, a, a significant gender gap in terms of women's leadership uh, on all levels. And um, this is part of the, let's say, the challenge. While the evidence is certainly there and we see the private sector very much um, uh, talking uh, about this and studies and, and making advances, but we still have a lot in terms of actual implementation. Um, we can build capacity of women and in the ILO we're doing things with uh, through social dialogue, uh, for example, supporting emerging women leaders in the garment sector, worker and employer uh, representatives to take up social dialogue positions. Um, but we see that there there is this ongoing gap of women around the decision making table. It's happened during COVID as well. We have seen that women are very uh, minimally represented. And then um, we're missing out on that innovation. We're missing out on the perspectives, the experiences and the needs that uh, women would bring to the table that uh, would be different. And, uh, and, and specifically that innovative aspect of the solutions we need for a world of work right now, which is extremely complex. So we're, we're certainly paying, paying a price for this in not making sure that women can and do get to the decision making table. And that doesn't mean that we need to only build the capacity of women. We need to also look at the surroundings. We need to look at the environment. Is it enabling? Uh, looking at things like the unpaid care uh, responsibilities. What can we do to further uh, make sure that women can get to those tables? Are we making our meetings, our, um, our workplaces uh, responsive? And there's a lot of good practical guidance on that that the ILO and others have. And as well, are we making sure that they're free from violence and harassment? Uh, which is certainly a big impeding uh, element, in particular for younger women who face it disproportionately. Back over to you, Sharon Jit. Thank you for that, Joni. Now, I'm conscious of the fact that, uh, you know, you, you're all incredibly, uh, you know, eloquent, uh, insightful speakers. You all represent uh, different parts of the, the pie, uh, as you say. You've got governments, private sector, multilateral development banks, NGOs. So my next question is, how can all of you here on the screen come together, build stronger coalitions between uh, all of you, uh, the governments, the private sector, the, the MDBs, and, and break down silos? I mean, how can we all work together to really achieve a, a lot of what you've all been talking about, which is obviously uh, to include women very much at the, uh, the center of this COVID-19 recovery when it comes to labor participation? And whoever wants to speak first, please tell us. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so first of all, let me just totally endorse what Dr. Nishtar and Joni Simpson have said about voice and culture. We uh, work with, you know, dozens um, of, you know, private sector institutions and public sector institutions, and. In all of the work, the, that uh, internal work is just as important as the external work. You can't just have products and services that meet the needs of women. You have to work on the institution's own internal biases um, 
and uh, leadership structures in order to make their external work more credible. So this is a really critical issue that cannot go um, unaddressed in any of the programs that we work on. Um, but to answer the question about uh, coalitions, um, of course, WeFi is a coalition because we um, are supported by uh, many governments. Uh, we work across the multilateral development bank network. Um, those partners work with dozens of uh, public and private sector institutions. And in their work, they also partner with other key stakeholders, other standard setters and NGOs that are working in the same space as we as we do. And uh, we we think that we cannot get our run unless we find these ways to partner. Let me just give you an example. One of the big bottlenecks we see in access to finance is that we don't have enough data on whether women are getting funded by the private sector, by public sector programs. And therefore, we really can't uh, hold ourselves accountable to making sure we're closing the finance gap when we don't know what's happening with data. We're looking now at a great initiative that they've just uh, published uh, their first report on in the U UK, uh, the Investing in Women Code, uh, which has brought 100 financial institutions from around the UK in to commit to doing more to serve uh, women entrepreneurs and to track their data on women entrepreneurs. And we want to look and see what we can do globally uh, to replicate something like that. It requires collaboration across uh, the multilateral development banks, standard setting bodies, financial institutions, and governments and regulators uh, to make something like that happen. So. These kinds of uh, initiatives are even more important now as we need a robust response to the crisis. And we really need to create a more sy systemic approach uh, to resolving the bottlenecks that we face in addressing women entrepreneurs. Thank you, Wendy. And I believe, uh, Joseph, you wanted to jump in next. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shanji. Um, in ADB's case, we have brought it specifically into our, our long-term strategy, our strategy 2030, um, as one of our operational priorities. Um, and it, it's not just a, a, a question of, of, of ticking boxes, but of saying, here are specific targets that you'll be accountable for. Here are interim targets that, that must be met in terms of ADB's operational program. That then builds into the discussions that ADB has with its member uh, countries. Um, you know, what kind, how can we bring in gender into our operational program? It's part of what we're accountable to, our board, our, uh, our board of directors, our board, and ultimately our board of governors. Um, and therefore, it, 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 is, it is built into the, those conversations. Um, I think we're seeing uh, the outcome of that in our, our COVID responses. Um, it would have been uh, easier to just say we need to provide budgetary support at this time. Um, but uh, by having this accountability at a corporate level, uh, it, we then build it into even these, these uh, pandemic response uh, initiatives to make sure that we're recognizing that there are, are different impacts between men and women and that those particular needs are being met uh, even, even at this, this, this time where otherwise uh, it, it might have gotten overlooked. Uh, back to you, Shanti. Thank you for that, Joseph. Uh, just checking in with any of the other panelists, if you wanted to uh, to talk about this particular, uh, you know, attempt to try to work together to break down silos. Otherwise, I may bring in our next topic. Anyone else? Sure, I'd I'd love to come in if that's okay. Yeah, yes. Oh, Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from the from the ILO side, uh, I'd, I'd like to also um, mention we've got a great partnership with ADB, and uh, actually right now we're we're working on a new study on the care economy in the region with ADB and UNDP. Um, and, and at the ILO, we've really uh, actually off of coming off of our uh, centenary, um, which happened uh, not so long ago, we have integrated a transformative agenda for advancing gender equality in the world of work, which very much uh, links into this um, element of uh, coalitions, alliances, um, not only across uh, various outcomes of our results measurement framework, but also within the UN and, um, and across our social dialogue instruments. So I really think that at this time, uh, we're set up 
we're set up well. We've hit a, we've hit up bumps in the road, and certainly with uh, COVID. Um, but again, we have this opportunity uh, to restructure in a way that uh, that pulls together the various uh, strengths of the various agencies and, and partners. And um, I think we've got a lot uh, moving ahead in terms of um, making that happen if we're accountable and if we're sure to put women at the center of these responses. Back over to you. Thank you, Joni. Yeah, it's really great to hear what's going on there in, in, in terms of how everyone, uh, everyone, it's a whole of society approach, isn't it, is working together to try to break down these barriers. Now I'm going to move on to this other notion that obviously there are other strategies that could potentially be helpful. You know, for instance, um, you know, uh, are there strategies from other areas that we're seeing, for instance, climate change uh, that, that could be adapted uh, for gender? Is that something that any of you are looking at? Uh, I can come in here. I think, I mean, very quickly, one, one, one example I wanted to highlight is obviously what's uh, changing the way, you know, we disclose information as, as large cap and, and, you know, therefore direct finance towards uh, sustainable initiatives in Europe led by the, the EU taxonomy, where, you know, the focus so far has been on climate. But, you know, when you look at the way that it transformed, you know, the, the way that we approach the climate crisis, is, is phenomenal. So it, I cannot help but wonder uh, whether something similar led by policymakers uh, in the gender space could be uh, replicated. We're going into areas of more social disclosure, obviously picking up the, the issues around human rights, modern uh, slavery, etc. But broader sort of requirements around disclosing gender and in, um, inclusion data, uh, particularly in the stock exchanges, could, could go a long way. Yeah, and we come back to the idea of data, which has been a real challenge, isn't it? Does anybody else want to uh, jump in on this? Um, I can, uh, I, I can first of all, um, agree with Denise on the data front. As I've said before, that's uh, incredibly important. But the other thing I wanted to mention um, that's very important in the in this space of entrepreneurship is uh, women working in non-traditional sectors. Uh, what we find is women are clustered in traditional sectors and service sectors and in the care economy, uh, education, services. And those are the industries that are very vulnerable to the kinds of crises that we've seen today. When we look at things like climate change and others, it's really important to bring women into non-traditional sectors, to support them, to move into the technology space, to move into engineering industries, to work on infrastructure. All of those are businesses that are uh, can be more diversified for them, better with accumulation and better margins. Uh, but that really has to do with our educational system. So something we really need to think about is how do we support, how do we create role models, and how do we build uh, more, uh, variety in the in the types of enterprises that are being run by women. Thank you, Wendy. Now, uh, I realize that we've got some questions coming in from the audience and I do want to get to them. So thank you for uh, asking those questions and please keep them coming in because I, I will get to them eventually. But uh, I'm also curious that, uh, you know, this this is something else that we've been talking a lot about uh, that you've been hearing on the headlines. and. The, the notion of a, of a great reset, you know, how this pandemic can provide a, a clean slate, an opportunity to deal with challenges. You know, we mentioned uh, climate change to deal with the environment, uh, even a reset and a look at how we measure our economies. But could this pandemic provide, do you think, a, a great reset to in the kind of ingrained expectations of women and, and their role and participation in the labor force. I mean, could this be a great reset for the better or the worse? What do you see? Mm -hmm. Joseph? Uh, I, that's a really com compelling question that you ask. Uh, I mean, it, some of the problems that we're seeing are that uh, it, during the pandemic itself is that there's a default towards women in traditional worlds, of taking more of the, the care duties at home. 
um, at the, the at the sacrifice of their their role within the the labor markets. So I mean, there's definitely that risk um, uh, that we could go backwards on on uh, uh, gender uh, uh, progress that we've seen over the last decades. Uh, so that's that's certainly something that we need to to be mindful of. I don't think we're going to 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 go back to the way it was without an effort uh, to ensure that we don't uh, allow this default to, to stick. Um, I guess on the positive side, I would point out that we are seeing more men involved in some of the care activities. Uh, so the, the UN survey that, that, that was done in, in Asia, it did, it did see that men were also taking on some of the household care activities. And that I think is at least some promising sign uh, uh, that it's, 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 not, it's not all uh, going to go back to uh, the, the 1960s in, in the way that, that we view things. But I do think we, are, we do have to be careful of that risk uh, of moving backwards when we start to think about how to make sure that the, the reset uh, uh, benefits women. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Joni, I believe you had something to add. Indeed, and, and I, I think we're at a pivotal point here where we, we have a choice to, to make. Um, and I think we know what we need to do. Uh, a lot of, you know, what is happening now in terms of gender equality is not new. It's, uh, it's old business. It's been there for some time. It's just been further exacerbated. So we have the tools. We have, we have a lot of data. Uh, we don't have all the data, but we have a lot of evidence. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, policies. We have standards. Uh, we need to get to work on pulling it in together. And I think what you've mentioned, Sharon Jit, is very much an opportunity is that, you know, um, the, the climate change uh, element there is, is pushing us on uh, transforming. Uh, this could come, uh, just transition with gender equality is very much um, a, a possibility if we sit down and, and we integrate gender responsive policy making across the board. As well, I'd like to, to pick up on a, a point there on upskilling. Um, uh, Another speaker pointed to the very important element of uh, non-traditional uh, uh, opportunities for women, you know, categorized in, a, in fewer job categories and sectors than men. I think there's a lot to be done on the sectoral level too, where it's perhaps uh, more practical um, uh, to make sure that women are able, just like men, um, to get into those non-traditional um, uh, sectors through upskilling and lifelong learning, uh, not just at school, but all along the cycle to be up to speed, to be able to take up those opportunities, be a woman uh, entrepreneur or uh, a woman in employment. Thank you. Thank you, Joni. Anyone else want to jump in? Otherwise, I'm going to go to some of those questions. Yes? Sanya? Can I? So uh, I think it's, first of all, it's very important to appreciate that there's a very clear opportunity to position women uh, center stage uh, in terms of their role in the society as we move towards this new normal, this great reset, this post-COVID context, whatever you may want to call it. But it's important to appreciate that here there is a real opportunity. Just, just as there is an opportunity to bring climate action against climate change center stage, just as there is a real opportunity to mainstream digital ways of working, there is also an opportunity to mainstream gender equality. Now, as we do that, and as we focus on the question of access, rights, opportunities, freedoms, privileges, with respect to the gender equality lens, it's also important to appreciate that there are certain normative and standard setting actions that the world demands of us. Uh, and going back to your earlier point about breaking the silos and how can we um, work better together, we need to appreciate that in, that in positioning the role of women in this new normal uh, and with respect to the question of um, standard setting uh, and normative action, uh, there are responsibilities of international actors who need to work with governments. And there's a responsibility of the civil society uh, to act as watchdogs and to bring to bear the important considerations. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a time limitation that we are working against. Because we see 
that actors who are responsible for mainstreaming digital ways of working are very uh, cogently working at this point in time. Uh, those who have the interest of climate action at heart are, are uh, you know, working very coherently. Uh, but I think that there's a stepping up that needs to be done. Uh, and I think the those who are the custodians of this agenda in the multilateral system and the UN system uh, with key governments need to come up with, with clear transformative uh, normative actions at this point in time, whether they relate to um, data and data disaggregation, mandating data disaggregation by gender across all information sources, uh, or whether it is giving get greater weightages to gender-related variables and composite measures, which are the basis of leak tables to monitor A, B, C, and X, Y, Z, uh, whether it is a new framework for mentorship, whether it is reimagining the role of women in the work uh, force of tomorrow, uh, or all of the above. But something transformative needs to happen, and there has to be very clear leadership for that somewhere within the international community uh, in partnership with key governments. And I don't see that happening. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, rather a dismal point there, I, I should say. But I've got about just over 10 minutes now before the end of this discussion, uh, just about 20 minutes rather. Um, and I, I really like to get a sense of, you know, what you all think. Um, and we've got a lot of great comments from uh, the, the questions that have been coming through. Um, I want to ask a question that's from Yen from Care International in Vietnam. Uh, this specifically addressed to the ADB and the ILO. And, you know, we, we did hear you uh, talk about the, the issue of unpaid care work for women. So how is it possible to address that? I mean, it seems like such a, a, a difficult, challenging thing. Um, and, and Yen wants to know, you know, how do you address unpaid care work and increase opportunities for women's access to uh, employment towards, of course, a more inclusive post-COVID uh, future for women? What are some of the really, you know, simple policies that we can get at? Because, again, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, the lack of data. How do you measure these things? It is a real struggle. So this is um, addressed to the ADB and ILO. Um, Joseph and Joni, would you want to try to take a stab at it? Or anyone else for that matter? Okay. Um, I can come in on that. Um, I, I guess one, one starting point is... Uh, um, how do you how do you take the the, the role of um, uh, of motherhood and think about that uh, and and childcare uh, in a way that is more uh, uh, gender inclusive? So there are some elements that um, uh, have become uh, have inhibited women's work uh, in their ability to to stay with with their employer. Um, and so uh, previous research that I'd done on, on labor's laws um, looked at this question of maternity leave. Um, if maternity leave includes a mandate where employers uh, are required to, to, to bring uh, workers back after their leave, um, that's one element that, that ensures that women uh, um, uh, get that firm level human capital that allows them to, to, to move up the ladder. Um, and, it, and surprisingly, it doesn't necessarily have the, the, the cost to the employer because um, they get the, the, the individual back and are willing to make those, those investments. Um, so these are the types of, of perceptions that need to be broken so that uh, um, the, uh, women can uh, have that attachment to the workforce that would otherwise be lacking. Um, but that's really sort of the first step. The, the, the types of uh, policies that then make that leave gender neutral would also include paternity leave. Um, and that's a, a, a starting point where even when paternity leave is there, uh, cultural norms may uh, uh, suggest that, that men are less likely to take it up. So it's going to be <clears throat> uh, uh, a slow evolution, but by providing that, that, that policy framework, it at least opened the doors for that change. Um, uh, finally, once women are in, in work and recognizing their, their role as, as caregivers at home, there is going to need to be some, some look at the societal benefit of having uh, child care, uh, early child care to free up women to enter the workforce 
while providing uh, children with a safe space to develop. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Anyone else want to jump in on that point? The issue of the unpaid care work, how, how can we address this? Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> Yes, indeed, it is. It's it's such and it's such a transformative uh, transformative area for gender equality. Um, and uh, you can you can say right now, you know, we've seen uh, during COVID there have been a lot of um, important measures put in place uh, towards social protection. And um, uh, the AADP representative just mentioned maternity protection. Well, the, the majority of of women in the region actually don't have access to paid maternity leave. So there there are standards on this. And, and very much uh, aspects that um, uh, can be put in place uh, in, in this uh, build back better. Um, and, and also just thinking of all of the, the good um, measures that are there for the short term, how can we consolidate them? Uh, the, the social protection measures are one of the the most important safety nets uh, for uh, workers and um, those most marginalized, and they include a lot of elements towards that uh, addressing that care um, uh, deficit. And uh, I'd like to mention the importance of investments in um, child care and elder care and and all of the various care services that are needed. This is a job rich uh, growth area with opportunities um, for uh, generating new jobs. We really are facing deficits I mentioned earlier in this area and the private sector has very concrete things that can be done as well. And and we've, we've got someone um, talking about women's entrepreneurship mm -hmm. on, on the panel as well. well Private sector is where the jobs are. Uh, they're the, the main generator of jobs and there are very practical measures that can be put in place on flexi work. Uh, some companies are, are working to support setting up of, of early or, or childcare facilities uh, nearby, uh, working in collaboration with others. Um, and there are very practical things that can be done. Um, and we've got plenty of guidance on that level through the standards, um, uh, the international labor standards, but also from the private sector perspective uh, and what has been done that we we share around. Thank you, Joni. Now, I realize we've just got under 15 minutes, so I want to race through some of these great questions that we've got from some of you. Uh, this next question, again, we go back to this idea, and it's a really intriguing idea, the idea of uh, uh, gender targets within these COVID recovery packages. We heard Joseph speak about this. We heard uh, Dr. Sanya Nishta speak about this. And in fact, this is a question for you, uh, Sanya. In, in your opinion, how critical was the target of 50% for reaching out to women, whether the program would still have reached uh, out to as many women as it had done without a specific target, uh, especially during the pandemic? So this is really crucial because, you know, it touches on so many things, uh, gender targets, uh, with boardrooms, uh, but now with these COVID recovery packages. So give us a sense of your perspective, Sanya. So if yes, yeah, so, so the 55% plus that I referred to is an, is an overarching principle within the SAS rubric. So any SAS program, whether it's a conditioned cash transfer, non-conditioned cash transfer, a care service, whether it is uh, um, a scholarship or a cash for work or a uh, access to uh, uh, to assets has to be at a minimum 50% uh, for, for women. So it is, so overall, it's very crucial to the operations of the entire framework program. Uh, during COVID, um, our, the, we followed the same principle that 50% of the cash transfers have to go to women in, in, the, in the households. But there was a very important consideration in COVID that we needed to bring to bear, uh, which was the disruption of livelihood. In Pakistan, there are 24 million breadwinners who work either in the informal sector or are self-employed uh, or are daily wage workers. They're predominantly men. And during the COVID crisis, when the first lockdowns came into effect back in March of 2020, what actually happened were, was that there were these millions of men stuck in major uh, urban centers, unable to go back to their houses, unable to learn, earn a daily wage, 
They were just stranded out uh, on the streets. They were at the literally at the verge of starvation. And I recall uh, just before we launched the SAS emergency cash, people calling me and telling me as the cabinet for, um, a member responsible for social protection uh, that something needs to be done because uh, we, we are virtually at the uh, at, at the verge of uh, civil unrest because there are these um, men who are out there uh, without a daily wage, unable to go back to their rural abodes. Uh, so this is a long-winded way of saying that at that point we decided that we will stick to the 50% principle, but we will allow men to take the cash assistance as well. Otherwise, our unconditional cash transfer is 100% is for women. So we brought it down to 50% plus, uh, allowing these men to take advantage as well. But I'm very pleased to say that even at that very dire moment where there was a very clear indication to allow men to come forward and take these, take assistance, even, even at that very dire moment, we were able to stick with the principle of 50% plus. So I just want to emphasize that if you have a target, you have a clear metric, you have a means of verification, and you have a political commitment to see that target being met, it is only then that you are able to deliver on, uh, 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 you know, on a policy premise. If you start wavering, because I've been in a lot of meetings where, uh, where uh, you, you, you know, a whole group of men tell me women are not coming forward to ask for scholarships. Uh, women are not coming forward to ask for assets. They're not coming forward to ask for, for loans. And you just have to keep hammering in. You're not communicating to them properly. You're not, uh, your outreach is not proper. Yeah. Uh, because if you deter at that point, uh, then, then it's a slippery slope uh, downhill. Thank you, Sanya. That's really insightful and really good to know that, you know, it, from your perspective, gender targets within those recovery programs are a good thing. Now, I, I'm conscious of the fact we have less than 10 minutes now, and I do want to get to a lot of these audience questions because some really good ones. Let's squeeze in another quick one, and if we could just get some short answers from you, and then we can get to wrapping up. But, you know, this is a question specifically, again, for uh, the private sector. So I guess it's Wendy and Denise. It's, it's a question about, you know, leveraging capital for women's enterprises, you know, the, the need for financial and digital access is key. Yet we know, of course, there are so many women in the economy. Uh, they are the lowest earning segments, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the world. And they need more support when it comes to access to decent markets and livelihoods. So, you know, how crucial are, is it that they are in this circle, that somehow you can bring the women in the informal economy into this ability to even be able to access uh, markets and, and, and capital? How, how much of a struggle is that? Um, so maybe I'll kick off. Um, so yes, absolutely. Women-led businesses are far more likely to be informal than male-led businesses. And as I mentioned, um, they are, they tend to be in lower margin sectors, um, with less growth potential. And so finding ways to bring them into the formal sector is really critical. And, uh, you know, it used to be we would think about, well, how do we get them to register? How do we get them to become formal? But really what they need is access to markets and access to finance. So how do you build institutions and work with those existing, you know, parts of the private sector and the public sector that can serve them to really reach them and give them a reason to formalize, right? To get access to finance, to get access to markets. And so, you know, a lot of what we try to do is see how we can spur growth by working with intermediaries that are gonna help those women, you know, understand how to uh, manufacture, to put something into the value chain of a larger uh, value chain or how to get access to finance through a formal financial institution. Those are the kinds of things that make it worthwhile for women to, to become formal, which gives them access to so many other services. So um, we, we see a lot of institutions trying to figure out how to, how to bring them in and a lot in that process formalizing. Another really critical issue is digitization. So uh, as countries move towards digital IDs, as banks move to digital finance, as we lower 
lower the barriers to access to lots of services that are delivered uh, digitally, we see that more and more women's women-led businesses will move into the formal sector and and start to access those services um, more frequently. That is reassuring and very good to know. Now, uh, we have six more minutes left. And uh, I guess at this stage, uh, we can start wrapping up. Um, there are some other great questions uh, here, but um, you know, hopefully we can uh, get to these questions uh, at, at some other time in a future panel, perhaps. But thank you once again uh, to everyone watching for, for you know, asking those fantastically insightful questions. And yes, you have had incredibly insightful answers as well from our great panelists. So I'm going to now ask a, a final question, just as a way to wrap up. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the different policies, the, the recovery packages that are in play, the ability for the private sector to, to come in and help support a lot of these government programs. Uh, you know, things like women's bonds, I mean, innovative financial solutions to try to create and, and solve this massive problem we have when it comes to, to the gender wage gap, gender disparity, and, and particularly how much damage this pandemic has inflicted uh, upon women and work. So my final question to all of you is just a quick one minute takeaway. How are each of you pushing for more women focused recovery strategies? So let me start with uh, Dr. Sanya. Oh, I, I think that I've uh, already mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the portfolio I'm responsible for, the 50% plus policy, the programmatic intervention, the political will that's going behind it. And it's not just the policy and the political will and the institutional arrangements and the regular cadence of monitoring. Uh, it, it, it is also um, a very careful oversight. So I'd, I'd just say that that is my own personal commitment to, put, to push this agenda forward. Um, but I genuinely think that in order to meaningfully uh, push the needle on this, we need, it, we need a change of mindsets. And that change of mindsets will have to come by engaging men and, uh, and, and the family. It's uh, because sometimes we just keep speaking to women. We just continue to reiterate the importance of gender equality. And by just continuing to speak only to women, we sometimes compound the issue. So I think that we need to uh, broaden our horizon of engagement when it comes to um, progress on this agenda. Uh, and there are many other actors who need to be involved in this pursuit uh, other than governments. Thank you, Sanya. I'll, I'll go to Joseph uh, next. Uh, your one re minute response to this. Uh, uh, thank you. I think we, we have a really uh, a good opportunity to use this as a, a transformative event uh, in, in terms of, of putting uh, the gender agenda at the, the center of development. Um, and in, in this respect, I think I'd like to uh, echo what uh, Senator Nishtar said uh, in her previous uh, uh, answer, which was you know, the importance of, of setting uh, clear gender targets, um, having that high level commitment um, uh, either within uh, the, the corporate uh, or the multilateral or the government to, to reaching those targets. Um, and, but then having in place an accountability mechanism uh, that, that it ensures that there, there are consequences to, to, to not meeting those targets. Uh, and that helps us to get that, that change in mindset that otherwise would just be very comfortably staying in, in, in the default mode. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Wendy, your take. Thank you. Um, I, would, I would talk about two things. The first is data and the second is disruption. Um, and on the first, you know, we, uh, as we've gone through the crisis, um, we've seen how little we know about the plight of women, women entrepreneurs, and how really the fact that we don't have enough data on um, how institutions are interacting with them uh, creates challenges. And, and that's something that we're very much focused on, particularly in the financial sector trying to find ways to increase our understanding of how women are being reached 
um, and what's happening because that's a way to enhance accountability and to make sure that we're really able to continue to put more money out and put it to good use with, with women entrepreneurs. And to do that, um, not just as individual institutions, but across a, a variety of stakeholders. So we think that data is a really important part of building back better. It's part of our infrastructure and we wonder that, that we get more of it um, on what the private sector is doing in the public sector. And the second uh, point I just uh, thought was on disruption. Um, this is a moment of disruption. Uh, value chains are disrupting, financing is disrupting, the way economies work are disrupting which creates opportunities. And we really need to think about how to give women the tools of the access to technology, access to markets, the mentoring support to be the disruptors, to be the ones who build back better and to be the ones leading the change on the issues that we're dealing with that are gonna transform the way we work and we live in the coming uh, 10, 20, 30 years. So we wanna use our work to empower women to help them be the disruptors. Thank you, Wendy. Quickly now to Denise. Thank you. I think first, my personal impact, I'm continuing to lead by example in role modeling, inclusive behaviors in my own office, remind my colleagues, my family, my partners to do the same. Uh, continue to, to work on products and, and partnerships to unlock capital with purpose for SDG5 and choose to challenge and continue to disrupt I think, as Wendy said, uh, we now have the, the, the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Joni. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, it takes intentionality. Um, as a gender specialist, I can say I've had many a frustrating evening when I've come home and said gender was not prioritized. But now what I see is there is a strong momentum. And within my own uh, scope and, of course, along the lines of the ILO's uh, priorities, we're certainly putting a strong focus on addressing the unpaid care uh, and the care economy um, opportunity in the job creation, as well as addressing violence and harassment, including gender-based violence in the world of work. And the third and final is on gender and just transition, having more and better uh, decent work in green jobs uh, across the region. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. Uh, we know there are many, many challenges ahead, but we've heard some great solutions today in the last hour and a half, I believe, some great insights into how to move forward so, you know, once again, I'd love to thank you all uh, and you're all back on the screen. I believe we have to take a, a group shot. Uh, thank you once again. So let's just smile at the screen, all of us. Wonderful. And you know what? I will bring this to an end now. Once again, thank you to all our viewers out there who've tuned in, who've watched, who've listened, who've asked some amazingly insightful questions. Again, a big thank you to our panelists, Dr. Sanya Nishta, Joseph Sweglish Jr., Wendy Telecki, Dennis Harut, uh, Joni Simpson. You've all been so wonderful and instrumental in trying to get us to the point where we can move ahead with something like this. It is such an important issue, of course, uh, to talk about uh, discussing these ambitious approaches to, to build back better through women's entrepreneurship, financial inclusion, and decent jobs for women. Thank you once again, and thank you to the ADB. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.